I am excited to be able to talk to all of you today and to touch base a little bit on property management. So how many of you live in an apartment currently or you rent from someone? Anybody? Okay, good. So thank you, because that tells me that you have some context on what we're going to be talking about and how renting somewhere can be an experience, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but for the customer and the resident. But what we're going to talk about today is really more about that investor and how property management drives financial decisions sometimes how it drives the investment, and how it drives having fun in, a, in your chosen career. So when you talk about property management, the purpose of having a property manager and an actual company that manages an asset that you own is really at the bottom line because you want to drive the value and you want to really increase the income you can get with it. Many of you are already studying about income and returns and all of those facets. So we'll touch on a lot of those. But what does the property management purpose really give you? It allows an owner or an investor to have a professional group manage their communities. And that brings in with it a lot of best practices, a lot of consistency, and a known group that knows how to drive the revenue. Because at the end of the day, that really is what it's about. So I won't read all of this to you, but you'll see more about maintaining the asset and about how do you improve it as you go along. So when you talk about property management, there are four really different types. Today, we'll talk some about the residential side of it, which can be single family homes like you'll see in a lot of the college towns. It can also be vacation and resort properties like you'll see where we have at Reef Holdings, we have not only the RV resorts now, but the hotels and the hospitality side. Those also have property managers in it. You've got the multifamily residences, whether those are duplexes, quads, or multi-site, which is multiple communities, each with 100 units or more. So we'll touch on that. You also will on occasion see com communities that are just townhouses or condominiums that maybe people bought initially and as those condos have aged, they've been sold and now are turning into rental. You also are seeing a lot more now along the Airbnb and the VRBO. And so that has become its own genre of property management itself. Then you get into the commercial you'll know much about that commercial because that really is all of your retails, whether we call them malls still, but a lot of them are really more strip centers now and the outdoor malls. We do we'll talk about office property that you can manage just like the building we're in. And also even now co-working spaces that you'll see. You've seen but with the softening of the commercial market and the commercial real estate, after the pandemic, when people started working more remotely, you're seeing that co-working space become an even, even larger part of the business. Then you tie it into the industrial. There you'll see your warehouses. You'll see what I call your really your light manufacturing. You'll see the logistics from it, how you tie into those, and really the Amazons of the world. And now you've got the Amazons, you've got the Timus, you've got all of these different groups that have become so adept at distributing their product that that has become a huge industry. And now we're seeing the need for employees and leaders that run those segments and understand the importance and how to do it really become much more in demand. Then the final is what they'll really tie in as special purposes. So assisted living, for example, that is its own site, type of site that has to have property management that specializes in assisted living. And the reason is because there are a lot of health care ordinances that are required that you don't have in the other genres. Okay, Then you've got the areas where you have live shows, such as the theaters for Broadway. Those have a specialty management as well because you are dealing so much with, um, with all of the equipment that goes along with that show, 
and with the groups that come in and out all the time, every time a show, versus at multifamily and commercial, you've got pretty much the same group of residents and the same group of renters if it is on the commercial side. You don't see that in your theater. Sports arenas, those go back and forth between the um, what I would call the hospitality industry, but that's another genre because there you're dealing with so many different groups that impact the experience of the customer. Everything from your food service to the teams themselves, to the cleaning, to the security that you don't see in some of the others. So I wanted to take you just a, a little bit more into that so you'd understand the different types of it. And we, even when you think of property management, you're also tying into asset management as well, which some of you will have had time to spend on. So just a little bit about multifamily that I found was huge. Do you know that even with all of the apartment and multifamily that's out there today, which is more than 20 million residences, we need another 4.3 million homes, individual apartment homes or single family rental, but another 4.3 are estimated to be needed in the next six years. That is a huge number. We don't have that now, okay? That's why the demand is there is because we don't have enough built. So you are seeing a lot of new build virtually anywhere, I would bet, whether you're in the Cary, North Carolina, Durham, whether you are in, um, whether you're in Oklahoma, Ohio, Texas, Louisiana, you're going to see new construction of apartment communities right now. And you're going to see them want to lease them quickly so they can get out of their construction loans. But nationwide, more than $485 billion are spent by renters for housing. And that number will grow as we have more renters by choice because of the complexities now with the interest rates of buying a home. It is very hard for somebody in their early 20s to buy a home these days because the down payment is so much and the interest rate then limits the amount of house that you can get. So you're seeing much more. Some of the markets that you're in are, are, there's really only about three states that are tying into where most of that demand is. One of the things that I love about property management on the multifamily side, and this is true in commercial, residential, industry, industrial, all of it, but one of the things I truly love is every apartment community is like a city. I tell people when I interview them for their first time job in property management, that if something happens in a city, it will happen in that a multifamily community. For those of you that have rented or are renting in a multifamily now, have you ever gotten a notice about a crime occurring in your community? Or have you seen a fire truck out there? Or are you seen an ambulance, okay? The reason is, because you have so many homes and residents together that anything is going to happen. So, for example, if you have a 400-unit apartment community, then you probably will have about 1,500 residents. So when you have 1,500 people together, you will have fires, you will have floods, you will have storms, you'll have rapes, you'll have murders, you'll have domestic situations. It truly is like a city because you have that many people together. And that's something that people don't always realize is you don't think about the side of property management and being on an asset that is a building as one where you need to have empathy and you need to have caution and you need to think strategically. Oftentimes property managers are asked to make decisions they never thought they would make. So for example, just to put it into a real life perspective, I once had a community and it was not a reef holdings, it was in a different um, role, but I had a community where a resident walked in with a gun in his hand to the office and told the manager, I just shot and killed my neighbor, can you call the police? Okay, quite a shock for somebody in the office. They went over, certainly in his hallway, there was his neighbor. Okay. 
They walked back over to the office after she tried to make sure if CPR or something would work. He laid his gun on the desk and he sat there and waited for her to call the police. Okay, That's a real life situation. I've had situations where you have a fire that is caused by whether it's caused by a resident or it's caused by a vendor. A fire is devastating because you watch people lose everything they ever owned in one short period of time. And then oftentimes you find out they did not have insurance that protected their belongings. Well, this is a major part of property management, even though it's one of the smaller pieces that occur, but it's one that has the highest impact on your residents and on your um, value as well. So it comes down to, this is what we've got. We've got the city, and now we need to think strategically about how do I manage this city? How do I make it make sense? How do I make it hit the business owner business plan? That's what you really want, the performa. Some of you have probably worked on performas. Is that correct? You've gotten to work on that? Good. Or you've seen in some of your studies how you have to look at a return on investment? Well, that's what this is really about. So regardless of what type of property management you're in, you're going to have a few sections. And this is where, as working as interns or when you're going through school and college, you can actually stop and figure out, what part am I passionate about? So you're going to have the accounting side of it, because that is a critical part, as you know. Accounting is where your nuts and bolts are that tell you if you're making enough money to pay all your bills, to pay your teams, to pay your utilities, to pay your investors, and to pay the mortgage, which is another up there. Then one of the other biggest pieces of property management is about the rent collecting. How much of the rent do I collect that I could collect? Okay. You've got the repairs and maintenance. You've got inspections of the properties that occur all the time by the on-site team, but you also have inspections that occur from your insurance company and from your investors and from your owners. Then you have city inspectors. So there are a number of different inspections that you can run through in property management. How do you put the money in and where does it go? Well, yes, you have security deposits, but really the two key pieces are gonna be your rent collection, your security deposit, and then the leasing. Because the leasing is the piece that will bring you the residence rent in and, and the deposits, and that's how you work from your income. Then you get into all of the other pieces that are ancillary. The other most important is going to be your repair and maintenance. Because the team that is doing your repair and maintenance and that office team are the ones that build the relationships that make you want to stay. Because at the end of it, property management, whether it's commercial, resort, hospitality, or residential, it's about building what I call TCR, trust, credibility, and rapport. So any business that you are in, and when you go into school and you talk to your professors, you may not realize it, but they are already forming an opinion of you. Even when you're sitting in a lecture hall, they're forming an opinion based on what they see of you or what they see of the work, okay? And with those, you have social identity and, of course, you have your professional identity or yourself, but those opinions are formed. The same thing holds true in managing a business like properties and assets because you are starting to build that impression up from day one. So at Reef Residential, which we also call RR Living, but it, it, the name is really Reef Residential, we rebranded to RR Living because we wanted to give a different feel on branding to our customers. And when you hear the name Reef Residential, it's so tied to Reef, but we want to grow the property management side even more on the third party. So then bringing it into RR Living, which is really using that reef residential, but we are tying in to the subliminal needs of our customers and residents with the word living, okay? 
So we want their living experience to be easy. We want it to be an enjoyable one. And we want to build TCR, trust, credibility, and rapport. Because if we build those items with our residents, then they will actually stay. So when we manage real estate for reef holdings or for another owner, there are several things that we have to do. First off, we have to embrace any change that's coming, okay? Because every owner is going to want change if as the economy changes. So as your economy changes, or say, for example, what owners have found recently, which is a mortgage rate that, that um, changes and goes up and down if it wasn't locked down, well, as that happens, you can imagine as that mortgage rate goes up, your available cash flow goes down, okay? So that is part of a change that you may not have known was coming, but we need to proactively work towards it. Then we have to identify solutions. So one of the things at RR Living that we really try to teach our teams is that you don't make excuses, just find a solution. Find a solution. Every decision that you make in life is a chance for you to find a solution and one you've not even thought of yet. Then we want our teams to execute on the strategic decisions and the smart decisions because that execution is the difference in being profitable or in losing money, ultimately. It's one thing to say, I want you to go out and be 95% occupied, but if you cannot execute on that, then you are failing, okay? Then you define the KPIs, the key performance indicators. You guys have heard of those all in your studies. You have to go in at, re, at RR Living and Reef Residential, and we have to improve the property. We have to improve the bottom line, and that starts with improving your resident and customer experience. So if you are at your apartment community, or if you're at school, and you're driving through, and you see trash everywhere, does that give you a perspective? Does it make you wonder? Mm -hmm. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you saw a compactor or a dumpster overflowing? Have any of you ever seen that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. That is not a good feeling, is it? No. Mm -mm. And it often gets posted on social media these days. So those are the small things that impact this resident and customer experience. The other thing that impacts it is whether or not you have great teams, team members on your team. So that comes from growing and developing them. And whenever you really talk about people, which is what it is, because property management success is about the people. If I brought Tony in here today to talk to you, he would tell you that the most important part of a success on a property, it starts and ends with people. Okay. That is a fact. So you have to have a plan. So our business plan is that we want to manage the business, okay? Because that is all your financials. That's hitting the strategy. That's the part you have to manage and hopefully proactively. Then we tell our teams we have to lead the people, okay? So you manage, you lead, that gives you the ability to exceed the customer expectations and to exceed the owner expectations, okay? So really, this is about four different thoughts. It's about managing, leading, exceeding, and then driving the revenue acceleration. That is thinking like an owner. What do you think are some benefits? I'm going to ask you guys this. What are, what are the benefits to having more revenue if you are running in a apartment community? Improvements? Absolutely. That's a good one. Who else? What else do you think? The bad month where you have a lot of vacancy. That is it. Yes. Then, and both of you are right. And there are so many different aspects, but you're right. If your vacancy is higher, there are some communities that are very tight on money. And by that, I mean, typically you're looking at about 45% of the income you bring in that goes to your operating expenses. So when you break down income, you've got income from your net, 
rents that are collected and you've got rent income from other income sources. And we'll talk about some of that. So as we go into the managing the business, which is where we will talk about how we do some of what we were just mentioning, is your, your presence and your people matter. We talked about that being the most important. That's because your team is your brand, okay? That's, that's really the bottom line. So for us, Reef Holdings, Reef Residential, there are many people that the only thing they know about the company is the people they see, okay? So that is where your people become your brand. There's a reason that each of you thought you wanted to go to the school and university of your choice. And a lot of that was through brand identification. Whether that brand was built subliminally and you watched the football games or whether it was built when they came into your school and talked about to you about the programs, you had to feel like you trusted that school. You had to feel like it was a credible school that you would be proud to be part of. This is no different. It's a business. So I always ask people, would you give me $20,000? Well, the real question is, when you go into McDonald's and you order your meal, would you give that person work in the cash register $20,000? 15 minutes after meeting them. Would you? Would you write a check? Why not? It's not a smart choice. Not a smart choice? Mm -hmm. Well, every day, my team, when they show an apartment to you, essentially we're asking you to write a check for $20,000. Because when you take the rent and you multiply it out times 12 months or more, that's about what it is. So you may go in and you look at an, at an apartment. What they're really asking you when they say, would you like to fill out the application today? Would you like to sign the lease today? Which you could say no. That was a yes or no question. Okay. We don't want them to say no. So we have to train our teams in how to sell with an ability to get somebody to give them $20,000 15 minutes after they meet them because that's what we're asking. So from that aspect, what our teams wear, how they carry themselves, how they welcome you when you walk through the door, those impressions matter, and that's your brand. They have to be professional and knowledgeable, but where else could we do that? Right now, we're looking at buying, um, and Jack is looking at buying three assets. So we wanna make smart decisions. To make those smart decisions, you do due diligence. Your customer does due diligence. Your residents do due diligence when they come and they vision and they visit different properties. You have to anticipate the things you don't know will happen when you run a multifamily. I call it the pay now or pay later. So there are so many mechanical systems, okay? Think about it. Your air conditioner goes out and you're in Dallas, Texas where it's warm or you're in New Orleans, or Baton Rouge, or wherever you may be, okay, what happens then is that air conditioner goes out, somebody has to come fix it. But did it go out because it needed Freon, or did it go out because it was 15 years old and nobody maintained it? That is what happens. So your smart strategic decisions made by the people that work on site, those impact your future revenue. So when we go in and we buy a community, there are certain things that we do. And we will go in, do the due diligence. We wanna go in, we wanna clean the AC coils. We wanna make decisions that impact the future because it makes maintenance less. You can't make those decisions if you don't have the right people on staff. You have to have a business strategy that's gonna drive those results. And how do you do that for you? When you get into a group in school and you have a group project to do, these same practices will apply to you. Setting clear expectations, you have to scale your team. And for me, it's our, our, our living organization. I have to be able to scale that so that when um, Reef Holdings comes in and says, I've got 10 more communities, I can absorb those 10 communities into management without adding a bunch of people because that is what the scalability is, okay? So for you in school, it's about, or playing on sports, it's about how do you maximize with the number of people you have? 
I'm sure you've seen that. You also still have to communicate clearly. You have to document. We look at things like whether or not we centralize or decentralize tasks. Right now, I have, um, for every community, apartment community, you typically will have one person inside and one person outside for every 100 units. Our, the industry now is moving to about 80 units, one per 80. What that means is if you have 300 apartments, then you will have three to four people in the office and you will have three to four people on the grounds doing service, which is your maintenance, doing all of those aspects, okay? We've got to find out and figure out how to do more with less because our rent increases and our income increases, but so are all of the other expenses and the cost of your people. So we are looking at ways to centralize tasks, which ultimately will reduce the number of staff on site. That's part of the strategic decisions, whether you use in-house maintenance or whether you use contractors. All of those pieces will drive ROI, which you see over there. So we talked about how you make decisions for the business based on how it's going to help you save money later. For example, if you put in a granite countertop, you will save money on an apartment community because if you put in the laminate or you already have the laminate, people put pots on it, it burns it. People put their cigarette butts on it. People slice knives with it and you see it all over. Granite doesn't do that. So I'm gonna have to replace the laminate on a frequent basis. Some of you may have been in homes or rentals where you had carpet, okay? Through the years, we've moved away from putting carpet into apartments other than maybe in the bedrooms. The reason for that is carpeting tends to last only two years or through one resident. And when it's college students, it's usually one lease that the carpet lasts, okay? And that's okay. It's just, you have to know it and plan in advance. So we've gone more to doing the laminate flooring or the hard surface flooring because it means you spend less when you look at the five-year period, which is what you're wanting to do. So all of that brings down to your people and the resident experience and the customer experience. We talked about our employees being our brand, but how well you take care of an asset as an owner, that also impacts your brand because customers make the decisions from how much they're going to pay you from the first time they drive past your community, okay? Think about it. You go driving down the road, you see a shopping center, and you see all these beautiful flowers at the monument sign, okay? That's a first impression. You form an opinion then as to what's in that store. You see a Louis Vuitton sign, you have an opinion before you ever walk in the door what's in the store. You see a Dollar General, you have an opinion. Same thing on your business. So as you're building out the business and you're going in and you're going to do due diligence on your first community or you're going to build out a revenue stream for one of your projects at school, remember that from the first point anybody sees it is where your income starts, okay? because that's when people decide what they're gonna pay you. We can do a lot of nice things, but we have to have our team members realize that sometimes taking a risk is good. Try something new. That fence where we put in a little fence around a patio, we have residents that will pay us $100 more a month for that small fence, okay? Because they have toddlers or they have pets. That's a good decision. Now, whether or not you put those small fences facing the street, because you typically will do that on an as-requested basis from your residents, well, if I have it on an as-requested basis, that may mean that I only have one. You're driving past 12 apartments with patios. You may only see one, or you may see two. That doesn't give a neat, clean appearance, okay? So something that small, uh, thinking, do I do it on the outside or just the interior courtyards, will impact your residency and your money. Whether or not you give move-in gift, you know, one of the keys to getting people to stay is they need to feel like they're nesting. So we know that when you first move in an apartment, if you go, you buy new furniture, 
or you decide you're going to paint, or you hang up your, your artwork because you like it, you're starting to nest. When you are comfortable where you live, you don't want to move. When you don't want to move, it means I don't have to pay somebody to come in and paint that apartment. I don't have to pay for them to clean the carpet or for them to clean the apartment. And I don't have to pay my maintenance team six hours to go in and make sure everything's working. All in all, one resident moving out at a minimum will cost us $3,000 at a minimum every time somebody leaves. That is a loss of revenue you don't get back. Most of the time, think about it that um, average rent may be $1,100, okay? If I'm spending $3,000 because one person moves, I've just given up $250 a month out of that $1,100 over a course of 12 months. So that is why you have to figure out what is going to drive not only your revenue, but that customer perception. So we may do permits. We may do resident parties. We're doing that in anniversary gifts because we think it will help you want to stay because you will then find a sense of community. People want to live and work with people that are like them, okay? How many of you pick a best friend that you hate? You don't, okay? So you have to pick us as your best friend or our living. That's what we want. We want you to think of our, our living as the place that you can grow old with. You can live in one of our communities today as a student. Then when you are single and you've graduated and now you're out having fun in your first job, we want you to go to one of our urban locations with a little higher rent, okay? That resident's a different resident. They don't necessarily want to cook. They want to go out and socialize and spend their extra income on having fun. Then you get married and have a family. That's a different apartment community. It's a different demographic often because the needs that you have in your life are different. Then as you age, you have active living, which is typically over 55, and but yet it's a perfect apartment community. They just have different resident events, okay? So that's the key, knowing your demographic, knowing and thinking like an own. You have to think, what will it cost me today? What does it give me in the future? If I spend $600 on putting in that fence, what do I get for it? The $100 a month. If I do resident events and parties like all of your communities will do when you live, they'll do a big party at some point. That party may cost them $600 or $1,000, but if it keeps one person from moving, it's more than paid for itself. So when you talk about the execution and success, it begins with your team. Same thing with your colleges. Where do the, for your colleges, where do their success begin? If for me in the apartment community, it's my team on site with maintenance and office, what is it for a university? What? Yep, getting you to commit. Mm -hmm. Yep. Faculty, absolutely. Because have you ever gone on and you've read the ratings about one of those professors that you just know you do not want? Okay. Yes, that impacts your career while you're in college. It will impact your career after college. It may not impact it directly because that person's not hiring you but it impacts your way of thinking, which then impacts, are you a risk taker? Are you somebody that is going to just follow the rules or did you figure out that you can push back and have a discussion? I don't think there's anybody that ever enjoys working somewhere when you can't push back and you can't say what you really think because your thinking is the first step to executing. So from an apartment standpoint, when, when I say, okay, what is it that people think apartment managers do? That's this group on the left. They think apartment managers collect rent. They think they chat with residents and friends. They think they answer the phone. They work 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., five days a week. These are all the things. They also, residents also think we save money by not fixing what they want us to fix. Whether that is a flooring or a replacing appliance, 
That's what they think we do. They think that we just show apartments and sign leases and we don't do anything else. The reality is very different. The reality is that if you chose to go into a real estate business and you're going to manage communities, even if you have your own portfolio and you go and you buy a home to rent out and then you increase that to buying three to buying five because you know already that if you visualize it and you may you manifest it it will happen down the road well you're going to act as a collection agent you're going to act as a rule enforcer you have to negotiate between the resident disputes because the neighbors complain about each other this one's dog's too loud. This one's kids run around the apartment too much and keep you up at night. This person has their music too loud. You're constantly being the negotiator. Our community staff tend to work 10 to 12 hours a day. That is just what it takes. It's not a 40-hour-a-week job. They also are on call 24-7. They work holidays. Their maintenance teams in particular, they're there 24-7. Because even though they're only scheduled to work eight hours, items don't break just in that eight-hour period. So floods and, and air conditionings and electrical problems and fires, it doesn't matter when they occur. My manager and my service team have to be there. Every time that there is a storm, we have the teams stay on site before the storm comes. That means my service team isn't home taking care of their own family or their own house. They're at the property because that's where our responsibilities lie, okay? So those are the things you don't know happen. You don't know that many times they get screamed at, the sites do, because when a resident sees us, oftentimes we, our team on the property, the office team, is their first person they see when things go great. We're also the first person they see when they had a bad day. Okay. They think of our maintenance team as their friends. So if I want to collect rent and somebody's not paying me, a lot of times I'll take a maintenance guy with me because that's their friend. And they will pay me faster because they don't want their friend to think they're not paying rent. Because it's the maintenance team that you get to know and you're, hey, bub, how you doing? Okay. So all of those things are what it really is. And how do you measure if you're doing good or bad? The same way you measure how you do in school, there are key performance indicators. For you in school, it may be grades. For you, maybe it is, how did I do on that project I completed? Or, how's my dissertation? Was it great? And you're going to stress over it everything. But the bottom line is, you have to understand that from day one. So, we have a group of nine KPIs which we've talked about already, which is team member engagement, completion of service request, is your resident satisfied? How much is your delinquency? Are you creating and gaining income? That starts before you even have somebody move in. That starts with your application. And that starts with knowing, do, do your residents make two and a half, three times more a month than the rent? Because that's what they need to be able to afford it. Are they really who they said they were? Okay. When 9-11 happened, one of my properties in Florida had one of the pilots living on site. Okay. There was a lot of hubbub around that later. We learned very quickly to start checking all of, all of the real ability for somebody to be in the country and to make sure that they are who they say they are. So there are a lot of things that come into play with these KPIs. It is how fast do you turn that apartment home? Every day that an apartment home sits vacant when you move out is roughly about $39 in vacancy loss a day, okay? So you multiply that, and if, say, if it moves out and they're not already 95, it's going to sit there for 15 to 30 days. So if I let my community teams take 25 days to turn an apartment, I just lost 39 times 25, that's not good, okay? I can't get that back. So it is imperative that you turn those quickly because you can't move them in if the home's not ready. You then tie into your renewals. You tie into 
the physical occupancy, the economic occupancy, all of those are really critical. We have two different kinds of occupancy. The physical occupancy, which is how many apartments are occupied, right? So if you have 100 apartments, 90 are occupied, you're 90%. The economic occupancy is really the most important, okay? Economic occupancy is how much of the rent can I collect that I do collect. So what that means is you have a market rent that is up there. Say it's $1,000 a month times my 100 units, okay? To calculate economic occupancy, you have to subtract out your vacancy. You have to subtract out any concessions, which I... I detest concessions because it's like giving you free money, okay? You have to subtract out any of the rent that's not paid. You have to subtract out if you give your employees rent discount. So after you subtract all of those items, that gives you your net rental income. In other words, how much of that $1,000 did I really collect? You want it to be at 93%. And that's your economic occupancy because the economic occupancy gives you the income you're going to need to pay your bills, to pay your payroll, to pay your utilities, to pay your mortgage. That's why those are the KPIs that really do impact your value. So where we think about innocent mistake from being knowledgeable, you know, these are the keys. And I think this will apply to you in some of your own lives as well which is you have to learn to excel in finding opportunities. You have to find opportunities. And that means you have to know what it is that your resident will pay for. You have a resident life cycle or a customer life cycle. It starts the day they drive past your community the first time, okay? So part of that life cycle is what they see before they ever move in. Then you've got the part of the life cycle where they're a prospect. They come in, they look at your community, they decide they're going to rent. Then you got your move-in period. And let me tell you, if that move-in day goes bad, do you know that they are 54% more likely to not renew their lease if their move-in day went bad? 54%. So that is a huge opportunity for everybody in the business because you can't afford to lose them because it's going to cost you at least $3,000, okay? You have to know what are re residents willing to pay for. It's one thing to put that little fence in if they're not going to pay me $100 a month for it. It's another thing to know they will. Just this past month, I took breed restrictions off of most of our communities, okay, for animals. So the reason for that, because most apartment communities will restrict pit bulls, chows, German shepherds, this whole, uh, there's like nine or 10 of them that they restrict. We're trying it non-restricting right now, but we have increased that non-refundable pet fee from $400 to 1000 So it's a risk worth taking. We believe that if we are one of the only communities in town that does take those breeds, then that that's a good risk for us to try. We also use a service that tells us if that pet has ever been involved in, a, in an altercation. And if it has, we won't take it. But those are the kind of things you have to look for the opportunities. I put COVID on here because when COVID came, it changed our residential multifamily business, just like it changed the university experience for many students. Everybody went online. Well, for us, in multifamily, what it told us was our amenities are not built for people to live on 24 hours a day, okay? We have pools. We have fitness centers. We have all these things you, we think you want, movie theaters. Um, now we're putting in some, you know, some of the cold plunge tubs, whatever it is. We never intended on people being on those and using them 24 hours a day. But that's what happened. All of a sudden, all the parents were home. All the kids were home. We had to adjust how we thought, and we saw much more wear and tear. We already talked about the first impressions and the life cycle. We talked about some of the experiences during the residency, and we've talked about 
how you build ROI and the decisions you make. We talked about the carpet. So think about it as like this. Carpet's one aspect. The other aspect is if you make a decision as an owner or an asset manager or a property manager, you can go and you can buy the cheapest compressor there is for an AC, but that may be your worst decision. You can buy the cheapest refrigerator. It may be your worst decision. And the reason I say that is because there is good money and there is bad money. When you buy a lesser product, it's not just that sometimes those products don't stay in good condition, but it's also that then if I let the service technician go out and buy four or five different compressors or condensers just because they're on sale, so every time he needs one, he buys one that's on sale or an appliance, the end result is, okay, they may work, but now my team has to maintain parts for all five of those different kinds. That's not smart, okay? That is not a smart decision. So there are reasons that you as an owner and you as an asset manager and as a thought provoker and a solution finder, you have to make decisions and not think about just the short term. Don't think about just because it's less expensive today. Think about the fact that if you only buy refrigerators that are on sale, then you may have white ones, you may have black ones, you may have stainless steel, but at the end of the day, that doesn't make you money. Residents want consistency, they want what's appealing, and they want it to work, okay? Those are the pieces. One aspect that I would ask you to think about, when you go drive past apartment communities, I want you to drive through some, and some of the older ones, and I want you to look at the windows, okay? And when you drive through those windows, oftentimes you will see mini blinds on those windows. And if you drive through and now you know to look for it, you'll see where pets have broken them and there'll be little holes in them or where they're all hanging kind of lopsided. Go, you'll be surprised what you see, okay? You drive through another community that has say the two inch wood faux blinds, you won't see that same damage. So while the two inch faux blinds that are plastic, they may cost me a little more to do the first time, your community as the customer drives by will look much better. When you drive through and you see all these broken blinds or you see residents that have curtains that are made out of sheets, it tells you in your subliminal conscious that that property is less valuable to you than another one that looks very crisp and clean, okay? So part of what your job is when you leave this room and you leave and go back to school, it's to pay attention to the details. Start thinking in terms of every time you see something, is that a revenue driver? When McDonald's does all of the advertising, is it a revenue driver? Trust me, if they're advertising it, it's only because they want to make money. So you start noticing those things, you become much more valuable to a future employer and you're thinking, outside of the box. We talked about the short-term expenses of buying the smaller pieces. Well, there are other things we can think of. For example, on an older community, when we renovate, maybe we take the garbage disposal out because the garbage disposal breaks frequently when you have certain demographic and cultures that are not accustomed to using them, okay? because different people from different countries have different ideas on their cooking. Some people, um, some countries will use, you know, a lot of bone in their cooking. You can't put that down the garbage disposal. Others don't. It's not that it's good or bad. It's that that is something that breaks often. Even if you are moving into that community across the street, a garbage disposal will break. But if it's on a property that's 20 years old, it's gonna break much more frequently. Every time it breaks, it's costing me at least $25 an hour because for somebody to go fix it and go over to the apartment, go to the shop, make sure we have the part, it's at least $25, okay? You multiply, if you have 10 garbage disposals a month that go out, I've spent 250 before I replaced any of them. 
So you want to make decisions that are based on the asset that you own. And that's by its age a lot of times. And that is by the people that work on the site. At the end of the day, it's about do I stay or do I go? That's what your residents are really talking about. And your residents are really judging you on. So when you go into business, whether you work in a bank, whether you work in an asset shop, regardless of where you work, at the end of the day, you have a customer. And your customer, you have to ask yourself, will this customer stay with my business or will they go elsewhere? I've given you pieces that are based on multifamily, but it really applies to any business. It's do you feel like you get the value that you paid for? We talked about $20,000 earlier. Okay, whether or not you would give that $20,000 check to the cashier at McDonald's. Well, when it comes up for renewal, you're asking yourself, is, it, is that experience I had in the last 12 months worth another $20,000? Did I get $20,000 in value? That's what keeps people there. You want it to be easy for them to live with you. Just like when you have customers in whatever business you go into, your customer wants to know, you take care of their needs, and it's easy to do business. In my business, they want everything to work in their home. They want the amenities to work, and they want to feel like they're respected and you care and you like them. Everybody wants to be liked. But at the end of the day, whether or not they feel like they are liked and valued and respected in your new world, that is worth money to you, okay? Having your residents trust you having them see you as credible, and having them know that you've built a rapport and you see them as a person, that's money. And they're willing to pay for that. Then you also have the former resident piece because that former resident piece drives your future customers. When you go into business, the same holds true. Referrals are key. We talked about decisions you make and thinking short-term and long-term because that impacts your revenue every single day. It also impacts the expense lines and how much you pay for what you purchase. Okay. So in the beginning, it really is about partnering and communicating, and then you tie into uh, knowing what the plan is. So in here, there is a sheet that you'll see and I put this in, not so we could go through it all over here, but to talk to you about how it really comes full circle. From the time when you first buy a community, this is the due diligence. You're creating a budget and you're creating your plan on what you want to do with the real estate that you just purchased. So then as an owner, you meet with the property managers, you decide which one has the best needs to, to fit your needs. You go through all of these pieces and every one of these, whether it's minor repairs that we noted were needed, sealing and striping of the parking lot, pressure washing, each one of those aspects has a purpose. And I have to ask myself, will this drive revenue? Will this grow my resident? If the answer is no, then I probably shouldn't do it unless I can say, will this save me on expenses. And if that's a yes, then in ultimately it is driving the revenue. But every aspect you want to ask yourself, is it gaining me more money? Is it driving profit and profitability? It's not easy to drive profitability. When you see financial statements and you'll see a number of different pieces and you'll look at it and that's great. You're gonna look for pieces that jump, jump up and down as anomalies. But at the end of the day, your financial statement needs to match what the owner's performa is. So as a real estate professional, we get this performa, it's our job to execute on it. So all of the items that we talked about are part of that execution plan. It starts with the due diligence, it goes then into the management, then it goes to executing and then the longer term executing. So at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is know your competition and then determine are those improvements that that owner wants to make going to push you above the competition. 
There is never a reason that your rent should be less than your competition. And if you have the right team on site, then you'll get more because residents value that trust credibility rapport and they will pay for it. They may not know what it is, but they walk out of that apartment going, wow, that just feels different. It's the personal touch. And that ties in with all of your business as well. So you've got all of those pieces that we talked about that tie it back together. But at the end of the day, it's about people. That's what you're in is a people business.